I'll just do the presentation intro and then I will hand it off to our speaker. I apologize if my dogs bark in the background. Sorry, <laughs> they're very loud. <laughs> So welcome to today's presentation, everyone. Uh, my name is Trinity, and I am a member of Pre-Med CC, which is a student-led organization that was established in fall of 2021. Our goal as an organization was to create an online program for pre-medical students at community colleges and universities with the hope of guiding the next generation of diverse and inclusive physicians. We know how challenging finding mentorship can be, especially in the middle of a pandemic. And while we advertise our organization as being for community college students, uh, our events are open to anyone. We realize that finding mentorship and guidance in a pre-med journey can be especially challenging for first-generation students, people that lack the financial resources, or just those that do not know people in the medical field. One of the best parts about our events is that they are virtual, so you can do it from the comfort uh, of your own home or wherever you are. We typically have events most Fridays from 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time and occasionally on Saturdays as well. And if you are a aren't able to attend the event, all of our sessions are uploaded onto our YouTube channel. After you have attended our event, you can log in onto our website and complete the quiz, uh, which will contain questions pertaining to our session today. And if you score 70% or higher on the quiz, you will be awarded a certificate to show that you attended our session today. Students that attend uh, all of our sessions uh, this year may receive a special certificate, so be sure to take the quiz afterwards. However, if you are just here to participate, that is also fine. And if you want to stay connected with our upcoming events or want to tell your pre-med friends that are struggling to get shadowing hours about pre-med CC, our social media accounts are all at pre-med CC uh, on all the platforms you see on the screen. Uh, and at this point, I am going to stop sharing my screen and I will do a brief intro before I let our speaker take over. Okay, so tonight I am going to introduce our speaker, Adrienne Camburis. Adrienne is a native of Baltimore and is driven to make an impact in her hometown. Since the age of eight, she has known she wanted to be a doctor, and after graduating high school, she joined the Army uh, to make that possible. After 10 years of service, she returned to college and earned a Bachelor of Science in Cell and Molecular Biology and Chemistry from Augusta University. She is currently a fourth year graduate student in the molecular Bi microbiology and immunology department as a part of the medical scientist training program at the University of Maryland. In her work, she, inv she is investigating how burns alter the DNA immune system and how it leads to susceptibility for further infection. She is striving towards her PhD in molecular microbiology and hopes to practice surgery in the future with a focus on burns, trauma, and wound healing. So at this time, I'll hand it over to our speaker and thank you for joining us tonight. That's a lot. I don't think I like her. <laughs> um, just before I get started, I have a very dry and sarcastic sense of humor and I'm very self-deprecating. So I'm gonna try and get through this talk. I don't know why I agreed to give a talk talking about myself, but here I am. So I'm going to be talking about how I went from um, an inner city upbringing in Baltimore to serving in the army to now being an MD PhD candidate, hoping to save lives doing one of those things. Here we go. All right. So I plan to present this in a series of steps because I feel like I've always tried to execute a plan. Um, so the first step for me was I was born and raised in Baltimore to a single mother. Um, I have a younger brother and my mom was a nursing tech. So if you don't know what that means is that she was support for nurses and RNs. Um, she did not really emphasize education. She didn't really uh, enjoy being a student. So she didn't really emphasize that to me and my brother. But what she did do was work her hardest to take care of the two of us. That being said, from the age of eight, I was responsible for my brother getting us to school, getting us home, cooking dinner, making sure he did his homework. Um, so it was a very challenging upbringing 
um, to be able to make sure that me and my brother were taken care of and that my mom was able to work without having to worry about us. Um, I was also just the nerdiest little girl you can possibly imagine. Uh, I love to read. I was friends with the librarian. I wasn't friends with many other people because I was super nerdy. So even being in like gifted and talented programs in my school, among them, I was the nerdy kid. So um, I kept to myself, I'm very introverted. Um, I was a very quiet child and you couldn't find me without a book at all times. And there, that's what I'm talking about. Just super skinny, glasses, as nerdy as possible. But I wanted to be a doctor. I read Gifted Hands when I was eight. And I was just obsessed with the idea that someone that grew up in a lower income family could make something of himself and become a world renowned, world respected surgeon was the first part of why I identified with the book. The second part was that um, if, sorry, Gifted Hands is about, uh, is Ben Carson's autobiography before he went crazy and jumped into politics. But he talked about his uh, most famous surgery was separating two twins that were conjoined at the head. So he walked through just how he had to orchestrate and lead this surgery and the twin survived and it was um, an impactful surgery in medicine. So just detailing that medical uh, journey and how he had to plan everything and work with all these different specialties and orchestrated this uh, groundbreaking technique um, was the other half of why I wanted to be a physician. I wanted to be um, someone that could make a difference like Ben Carson was. So um, you can see in this picture, um, this is my godmother. But the reason why I include this picture is because this is my church. Um, I've been attending it since before I was born. And something that is really prevalent in the Black community is that when you see a smart child, you tell her, oh, you're going to be a doctor or you're going to be a lawyer. You're going to speak something over that child to give them the courage to pursue something. So since I can remember, that's what's been told to me at my church. And I still attend the same church. I sing with the choir. I sing every Sunday. Um, but since that young age, that's something that's been told to me is that I could be what I wanted to be. But the problem was that there was no path to go along with that dream. So like I said, my mom did not encourage education. She went to a, a, a community college for, and she didn't finish. So she, her idea of higher education and the knowledge that she was able to pass on to me was not very broad. Um, so she's already always known that I wanted to be a physician. She's been supportive of me to be a physician, but she couldn't tell me how to do that. Um, so I think I'm going really fast, but we can just take a lot of questions. Um, I had to try to figure out how to make that happen with no real plan in place. So when I was a senior in high school, uh, I met a girl that she had done her basic training in the summer after junior year. She came back and was going to finish her senior year and then go back into the army after um, she graduated. And she told me about what she did in the army, what um, her service entitled her to, what that meant for her. And I saw it as a way out. Um, I was a straight A student. I was in a national honor society. I uh, didn't study for the SATs, but I still took them. But I couldn't figure out how to bridge that gap between high school and college. And I couldn't find any kind of support system to explain how to do that. So what I saw was the Army was offering the GI Bill at the time. And I knew that that was a way to pay for school. So why not join and be able to use this GI Bill to go to college? I knew that I wanted to go. I just didn't know how to go. 
So in 2002, I graduated from high school in May and I was in basic by the second week of July. Um, it was horrifying. I was shaking like a leaf on the bus. I was 17. I'd never been away from home before. Um, and I never had a job before. So this is just all a whole new experience. And then of course, I'm this introverted girl that um, doesn't, didn't really speak up for herself at all. And there's people yelling at you. <laughs> and I had, I had no one in my family had ever served. So I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Um, when I joined, I signed up to be a military intelligence systems repairer. So that meant that any system that the anyone in the military military intelligence community used, I had to be able to repair it. And then it also meant that if they got any new type of equipment, we had to learn how to use it first in order to teach everyone else how to use it. So um, my training, normally um, most people in the army have jobs where you train for either four to eight months, but my training was or four to eight weeks. My training was 52 weeks because there was so much that we had to learn and so many different systems that we had to become familiar with. And then after that, I did an additional three months of training um, to work on drones or unmanned aerial vehicles. And that was pretty cool because I, when I, when I would talk to the recruiter, I said, I don't want to work on airplanes. I don't want to be outside. And that's exactly what I ended up doing, working on airplanes. So, um, Joining the military was the environment was perfect for me because they give you you have a rank structure, you know exactly how to treat people as soon as you see them. Um, you everybody follows the same rules. It was ideal for me and my personality type. And I really thrived in in the army, which is why I ended up serving for so long. Um, I was only supposed to serve for four years. I ended up doing a little over 10 because it was just a, an environment that was well suited to me in my mindset. Um, but what I did learn was while I was serving is that you have to capitalize on any and every opportunity that's presented to you. So the Army has a program called um, tuition assistance where they'll pay 100% of your tuition up to so many credits um, for you to get um, gain college education. So I did a lot of my uh, general education classes using that program. So over the 10 years, um, even like while I was deployed and things like that, I would still work through um, my general education credits because this is separate from the GI Bill. This is a, a benefit that's only for active duty service members. So that's something that I didn't anticipate to use. But while I at, while I was serving for so long, that's something that I decided to do. So I did go to um, community college while I was in the Army using that tuition assistance program. And it really set me up in the future. I didn't know the, how it was going to set me up, but I ended up transferring in all my um, general ed credits for my bachelor's in science. So that allowed me to take, um, that allowed me to double major because I didn't have to take all those other general education classes and still graduate in three years. So just if you see an opportunity, capitalize it on it. If you don't see opportunities, make them for yourself. I definitely had to do that when I was 17, when I didn't think that I had this dream and this goal, but I didn't know how to accomplish it. So someone shared with me something that was something that was feasible and I jumped on it. So moving forward, I would definitely make that recommendation that either jump on opportunities when you see them or create them if they're not there. So optional to your plan is you can get a guy. So while I was serving, I met my husband. Um, we'll be married 14 years next week. Um, we have literally been together since I was 18. 
Um, yeah, this is, I mean, I'm 18 right here in this picture and there's this guy right next to me. We work together. These are the drones that I was talking about. Um, and here we are in our dress uniform going to a military ball and we've literally grown into adults together. I bring up my husband because not to say to go out and get married, but you can't do this by yourself. You cannot get through this process alone. I started it alone, but there's no way I would be sitting here telling you how I'm in, in this MD PhD program without the support of others. First, I would make sure that your circle of people that you trust the most, that you share your struggles with, that you um, work through your problems with are people that you can trust and people that will not throw it back in your face later. Like I remember when you was just, you was having a fit and, and you weren't being successful then and now you're trying to be successful now, but don't, you don't need people like that. You need people that are gonna be moving forward with you and supporting you while you're moving forward. If someone is supposedly in your group and says that something is impossible, that's not helpful. What's impossible, what, say, what you could say is, I don't know how to do that. I've never heard of anyone that can do that, but I'll help you find somebody that's done that before, or I'll help you figure out how to do that. That's a supportive person. But to say that's not possible, I've heard it so many times on this whole journey, is not helpful. And it's not somebody that you want to trust with your struggles and your obstacles. Um, second is mentorship. Mentorship is so important because these are people that are where you're trying to be and they're able to tell you their lessons learned before you get there so that you don't make the mistakes that they make. They also provide you with a network, which is something that I did not have um, going into going in, going into medicine. And it's something that you need. You cannot um, find people to shadow with get letters of recommendation, uh, find uh, people to write papers with without some kind of network. And having mentors is what's going to help you bridge that gap of, from you being the student in need to finding the people that are able to meet your needs. And you don't have to get all of your mentorship from one person. So especially in my situation where I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm a veteran, I'm a researcher, I'm a scientist, and I'm also trying to be a physician, I'm trying to be a plastic surgeon on top of that. All those different aspects of my life can't all be met by one person. I'm, I'm crazy. Like, I, I don't want to meet anybody else like me. So if I need to know about how to navigate being a Black woman in academia, for example, I have someone that I can talk to about that. If I have, want to talk to someone about my long-term career goals, I have someone I can talk to about that. I have a plastic surgeon mentor. I have a couple. I have research mentors. Like, is it? Don't expect to find all your answers from one person because you're a complex person with complex goals. So, if I could tell you anything, is to make sure that you establish a mentorship relationship. You have to initiate them. You have to like, so while you're in school, if you find a professor that you really like, or um, you find someone that teaches very well and they, you can relate to them really well, or they have um, a career trajectory that you admire, some, you identify with them in some way, you have to initiate that mentorship relationship, send them an email, go to their office hours and say, this, this is who I am. This is what I'm trying to do. Um, do you have any advice or guidance and make sure you maintain that relationship. I still talk to my resource, my research mentor from undergrad that uh, I just talked to her about my committee meeting and she talked me down off the ledge and she told me about how her committee meetings went when she was preparing her PhD. Um, it's support that your friends aren't going to understand, but you're, these career people in your career field are going to understand. So find your circle, maybe meet a guy, girl, maybe not, but 
find people that are going to support you along this journey. It's hard enough. You don't need people trying to tear you down in the process. Okay. Okay. So in 2013, I was a staff sergeant, which is half of my journey title. That was the rank that I was. I was already promotable to the next rank, meaning I was selected for promotion, but I had to wait for my turn to actually be promoted. So I was kind of in this limbo that anything that I did as a staff sergeant wouldn't count towards promotion because I'd already been selected for promotion. And I'd been on the list for over a year waiting to be promoted after I was selected. Um, I was already operating at the next rank. I was already in a position for the next rank. I was really stagnant in my career. Um, I also just couldn't imagine me getting any additional growth in the army. I would talk to my leadership and say, okay, well, what else can I do to be a better leader and soldier? And they, they would honestly, they would say, honestly, I don't know what else to tell you because you're, listen, I was a crazy soldier. Like I followed all the rules is to the best of my ability because I didn't want to be it's it's a real masculine environment. I don't I don't think I'm making any surprising statements when I say that. So I really was just devoid of any kind of feminine energy. I followed the rules. I showed up. I did what I was supposed to do. I led my soldiers. My soldiers did well. Um, so my leadership could, really couldn't tell me how else to to be to grow or to do better so I reached a decision that it was time for me to go and pursue this dream of medicine so I hadn't been in a classroom in over 10 years I went straight from high school into the army um so when I started college that's that summer semester I'm thinking I was a straight-a student I was I was I never had to worry about anything in high school Um, school is really, came really easily to me, to be perfectly honest. So when I took my first, I took a biology course, I took 17 credits in the summer. Don't do that. Don't do it. Okay. Just don't do that. Um, I, I took that biology course. And as I, I sat there and the professor said on the very first day, I want you to know that this class has a 50% attrition rate. And I'm like, huh, that's interesting. Because it was a summer semester, it was a faster paced course. So we we took quizzes every day on the lecture from the day before to make sure that we were studying the material and that we were keeping up. And I was failing these quizzes every day. And I'm like, we just learned this yesterday. How am I getting this wrong? What, what is going on? So instead of just saying, well, something's wrong with the professor, like clearly he's not teaching me what I'm supposed to know because there's, there's nothing wrong with me. I know what I'm doing, right? I went to his office hours. I brought my quizzes with me and I said, explain to me, please what is the correct answer and help me figure out how I arrived arrived at the wrong answer. I could have been prideful and just continue to fail the quizzes, but I also know that I know what standard I want to hold myself to. And that was not it. So he told me, he says, what you keep saying is that you thought you knew the answer, but then you select the wrong answer. So Something I learned in undergrad was that you have to know how you study, how you learn, and how information is presented to you might not be how you learn. You have to put that information in a way that you can learn it. And then you have to learn it to be able to recall it on an exam. So it's two separate things. So typically didn'tic learning, you're going to have a person with slides 
and they're just going to talk. There's no interaction. There's no feedback. There's no assessment throughout the lecture. It's just a lecture. Your job in the lecture is going to be the receive information. They're not going to repeat that information. Their job is to put the information out. Your job is to then go and learn it. Once you're in college, they're not going to make sure that you understand. Your job is to learn the information that they're saying to you. So I figured out that I'm a visual learner. I'm really good at remembering images that I see on a slide. But what I'm not good at is um, when people just talk. So I hate PowerPoint. This is why my, my PowerPoint is images and then I'll just talk. I hate wordy PowerPoints. So what I have to do is take those, take the information that I learned from the lecture and put it in a format that I understand. So I included this image right here. This is actually a entire wall dry erase board. And it's my whole semester of biochem on one dry erase board. And of course we didn't learn it like this. We didn't learn it in all these these different mechanistic steps. She taught a lecture a day. She talked about re the different reactions. And I then had to take it, and I have to do, I had to do this with everything that I do. I have to look at it as a big picture and then I'll start to learn the chunks. So know what your learning style is know how you best receive information, but then make sure that you are able to retrieve that information when the time comes. So I tutored in undergrad once I became a junior and senior student. And when I would tutor, the students would come and say, well, I don't, I don't understand this. I have a test and, oh, I already know all this. I don't need to go over that. I need to go over this concept. And I, well, normally in biology, concepts build on each other. So I would say, okay, tell me a concept that you know, and we'll go from there. And th so say the concept is glycolysis. They would start to go through the steps and they would, oh, wait, I don't know that. Let me go look in my book real quick. And then they would go and look something up. Or um, I, I, rem I know the name of it, but I can't remember it. I don't, let me look real quick. And I would say like, okay, so this is a concept that you say you know. And you had to look up multiple steps in this process. So if this were an exam, you wouldn't be able to answer these questions. And that's what I try to get students to understand is that you can note or think you know something, but if you can't recall it, it, it does you no good. You, if you can't recall information, because like it or not, we're evaluated. I do not like it. I do not like taking exams, but we're evaluated by exams. So you can have knowledge in your head, but if you can't apply it on an exam, you're going to fail. So know your learning style and make sure that you're able to put information in a, in a way, in a format or media that makes sense to you. And then make sure that you're able to memorize this information so that you can recall it on an exam. So this is what I would do. I had a corner in the science hall where I would work with a dry erase board. I would have my headphones on and I would just write over and over again, all these different concepts to make sure that from, from memory, so that when the exam came, I would be able to answer the questions. So what I haven't mentioned is that I also picked up some rugrats along the way. So I had my daughter's um, while I was still in the army and then I was pregnant with my son when I started undergrad and being a mom has had so many challenges, so many challenges that are just from the kids. Medicine is hard. Pre-med is hard. Being a wife, all that is difficult, but these three kids come up with so many things and caused so many problems. We literally just took our daughter to the ED last night because she, she needed stitches. Like we were there till 1230 last night. They are everything. I love them with my whole heart and trying to give them the best of what I can give them has been one of the most challenging parts of my journey. So of course, when I separated, I was going from a full-time job with benefits, insurance, 
And my husband separated a year after me. So we went from dual income to no income in a, in a year. Um, so the biggest challenge in undergrad was providing for them while still being able to focus and be a full-time college student because I was taking 18 to 20 credits a semester and they were all sciences because like I said I did all my um, general education classes in the army so to do that had to figure out funding so first scholarships are your friend apply to them apply broadly you never know when you're going to get selected um, I was fortunate enough to be selected um, as a Tillman scholar through the Pat Tillman Foundation, where um, they support mil uh, active duty military veterans and military spouses. Um, but you have to, when you apply the application process, it's very detailed, it's very in, uh, in depth, and they want you to be someone that's going to make an impact on society at large. You have to have a heart of service and knowledge. Um, to be able to apply. I did not think that I was going to be selected for this program, but I applied anyway, because it only takes one yes. It only takes one person to say, you know what? I like her. Let's give her some money. And then you can feed your family. So there's tons of scholarships out there. You just have to do some digging. I found the Pat Tillman Foundation through a Google, Google search, and they only take applications once a year. So I had to wait a year to apply and I got selected the first time I applied. So I would find things that are um, that are with, that are part of who you are. There's scholarships for women, there's scholarships for different college majors. I mean, there's scholarships for people that live in a specific small town in the middle of nowhere. You just have to look for the scholarship opportunities. The second is the fee assistance program. So like I said, I grew up in a low-income family, um, we didn't have, I was definitely, we were struggling to beat the poverty line when I was growing up. So um, my mom is the eternal hustler. Like she knows government systems inside and out. But I found out about the fee assistance program through uh, my one of my advisors. And I did a lot of reading to figure out how to, um, how to qualify to be a part of it and what it is it's run by the AAMC you get um well when I applied you get half off the MCAT I got a study guide for the MCAT and then I was able to apply to 15 schools without having to pay a fee and there is no way I'm telling you right now there is no way that I would be able to be where I am without the Pat Tillman Foundation and without the fee assistance program, this just wouldn't happen because I literally had, I got accepted to my school that I'm at now and they had an $80 reservation fee. I remember paying this fee and questioning about groceries because we, I mean, like I said, we, my husband and I were both in school at the time. We had the GI bill, but that's good for a single person. We had three kids that we homeschooled. So look for opportunities, like I said earlier, capitalize on the opportunities that are presented to you and keep the rugrats fed. They are not happy when you don't feed them. Oh, and this is the age that they were when I was an undergrad. So I chose these pictures specifically because this is what they, I mean, I had a big Yukon. This is uh, my daughter sitting on me while I'm trying to study. Um, this is them visiting me on campus. This here's my because I told you I, I studied on a big dry erase board. That's me writing and that's them writing. And yeah, th there's me right after I had him. So this is, I mean, 2013. He was born in September. So, yep, there they are. So as I was going through undergrad, I, I saw students going to conferences and um, doing different things with the faculty. And I was just trying to keep my head down and graduate. I saw undergrad as a way to be a stepping stone to medical school. So I did a lot of things that were required. I did the volunteering. I did the shadowing. I did everything that I could to be a good applicant. 
but there were things that I didn't really want to do because I was scared and it worked out so well just because I said yes. So I did a research project in undergrad because that's what you do as a pre-med, you do research projects. And it was a long-term ecology project. And my research advisor was like, well, would you want to present this at a conference? And immediately in my head, it was no, absolutely not. I would, if she first, the first thing she asked me to do was a poster presentation. And I mean, I'm petrified. I don't like talking to people. I don't want to engage with anybody. I'd rather just sit by myself. I, I think science would be ideal if I could just do the science and not have to tell anyone ever. Like if I could have someone else do the talking for me, that'd be perfect or do the writing, whatever. But she's like, let's do a poster presentation. So I did a poster presentation in Portland, Oregon, my first conference ever. And I saw that there was a University of Maryland representative at the, at the conference, but he was from University of Maryland, Eastern Shore. So University of Maryland has tons of different campuses. He was from the Eastern Shore campus. And every time I went by the table, he wasn't there. And at this point, I had already applied to medical school. And so I go back to my poster, I'm talking to people and someone comes up to me and I give my spiel, this is what I'm doing, this is pretty cool. And I look at his name, his name tag, and it said University of Maryland Eastern Shore. And I'm like, oh, I just applied to Maryland for um, MD PhD, which I'll get into in a second, um, as an MD PhD student. And this man not only what he was the president of University of Maryland Eastern Shore, had no clue. He called my school and gave a recommendation for me to the MD PhD program. And then he gave me a contact for the president at UMBC who sat down with me for a 30 minute session, like a 30 minute mentorship session that I will never forget. So this man fought in the civil rights movement, was arrested with Martin Luther King, Dr. Freeman Habrowski, you look him up, he's amazing. He's done so much for UMBC and made it a collegiate environment where they're getting research funding and they're graduating PhD students that are making impacts in Maryland and nationally. And he took 30 minutes of his time to sit down with me all because I went to a conference and presented a poster and capitalized on opportunities. So just say yes, it's scary, right? We're afraid, I'm afraid to be successful. I'm scared of, I'm also scared of failing. So that's why I was so ready to say no. Cause if I jack it up, I'm gonna be angry at myself, but just say, yes, take the opportunities. You never know what opportunities are coming or what's gonna happen from that opportunity. So this is me presenting that same research at uh, a different conference. And I ended up winning um, best undergraduate presentation. And actually they said that they thought that I was a graduate student because of how well my research mentor prepared me for this for this talk. And it, you would never experience a win if you automatically shut the door by saying no. Like I said, fear closes doors faster than a no. So just say yes, take the opportunity and maximize it. So I, like I said, have wanted to be a physician since I was eight. So here's the culmination of I'm ready, I'm going to apply to medical school. I was a double major. I was I I found a shadowing opportunity. My shadowing person was the person that delivered my son. And I was like, oh, by the way, hey, can I shadow you? I ended up shadowing for four months. Just look for these opportunities and jump on them. So I couldn't figure out how to get a shadowing person, a shadowing opportunity. I sent emails, I called. Nobody was willing to really do anything. So I worked with what I had. I had my family medicine doctor who I was seeing once a month and then every other week and then every week. And then finally I'm like, hey, since I'm about to have this baby, you should let me shadow you when I'm done. And it worked out. My other shadowing opportunity was a, uh, a plastic surgeon that went to my church in Georgia and I was talking to the first lady of the church and I was explaining to her, oh, I want to go to medical school. And she goes, oh, do you know Dr. Bob? And I'm like, who is Dr. Bob? Come to find out he's an elder of the church. He's a plastic surgeon. And that's how I found out I wanted to be a plastic surgeon because I was able to shadow him 
for an entire summer. So you need to have a plan and then not be shy about sharing that plan. I know it's hard to tell people that you're trying to do something big. Believe me, I understand that. But that person might know somebody that knows somebody that can help you. And like, I had no one, no one I know in medicine, no one I know with higher education, no one I know that is a, a scientist. Just But so to, the only way you're going to find out who's able to help you is if you know what you're trying to do and are comfortable telling people what you're trying to do. So I was only preparing to be an MD. Problem is, I really liked science. I loved learning. I would be in the lecture and be like, okay, but then you you found this receptor. It does this signaling. And then what? Like, what happens after that? Oh, that's a current area of research. I need to know the answer right now. Then I was on the ecology project. I got to uh, collect my samples, process my data, and find out answers. So I went through the process of finding out unknowns in undergrad. And I was like, I kind of like this. I don't want to give it up. So my research mentor, find your people, told me, why don't you apply MD, PhD? And I'm like, what even is that? I mean, I, the applications were literally about to open. And I'm Googling what's an MD, PhD program. So I had no clue. I did some digging, I found some programs, and I applied MD, PhD only to 15 schools um, because my research, uh, my research advisor was able to help me work through the application process, write the additional essays, get the letters of recommendation. Um, but you have to know what you're trying to do and how to best set yourself up so that you can be successful. So I write down everything. I have planners everywhere. I take notes when, so I, I don't forget things. I have a. Can, can you explain to them what MD PhD is? Because some people may yeah, not know sure. what it is. So um, I think that's my next slide. Okay. So, um, so MD, an MD PhD program is a program in that you will do your MD normal medical school but you also take like a leave of absence and, and do your phd in some topic that you want to get a phd in so for example i'm getting my phd in microbiology and immunology there's neuroscience and uh, biochem and wh whatever the field that you want to get your phd in it's a combined dual degree program so that you can do both in one educational setting instead of having to separate them so some people there's a person in my phd program right now where he's actually a resident so he finished the md matched and then was like i'm gonna get a phd so now he's getting his phds my my program allows you to do all of that at once so when i graduate one day I'll have both degrees before I go into residency. That's what an MD PhD program is. So yeah, I decided to do that. So here's when when I graduated. Uh, all the regrets. I think they're four, three, and one. Maybe this is 2016. Okay, med school. You know how I said I started undergrad and I'm like, I'm good. I'm all right. I can do this. I can handle it. Whatever. It's not going to be a big deal. And then that biology class was like, no, nah, girl, sit down. Med school is the same way. So I had already conquered being a double major with three kids, research, shit. like my schedule was packed, but I thought med school was going to be more of the same. It is not. The the best example I can give is that we started, uh, we called it bugs and drugs. So it's the infectious disease and antibiotics portion of med school. We did my whole semester of microbiology in one one hour lecture. And I was like, oh, all right. I found out very quickly that um, everything that they put in those slides, even down to the tiniest detail, is testable and you have to know it. So I treated med school like a job. 
I would go in at six before the kids were up and then I would stay until six. We had lecture either from eight to 10 or 10 to 12, depending on what year you were. And I would study from 12 to six every day because I knew when I got home, impossible. I mean, I had a whole little boy toddler that had access to Nerf guns. It would readily shoot me if I was trying to do anything. And then I have uh, my middle daughter loves to write on walls and then also ask a million questions. So you can't really get anything done in a house in the house like that. And then we, they were still being homeschooled too. So once you get home, you have to be mom and try to spend time with them as much as possible. And then once they went to bed, I was right back studying. So while I think I developed a lot of skills organization in undergrad, med school is you in a dumpster fire, in a forest fire, and you're on fire, and you're also crying. Like, it's a lot of information in a very short amount of time. I don't know how many people have heard the analogy of pancakes, but every day you're served two pancakes, two lectures. And every day you need to eat those pancakes, meaning you need to study those two lectures because the next day you're going to get two more pancakes, whether you're ready for them or not. If you don't eat them, they're going to turn to four and then six and then eight. And then next thing you know, you're behind 10 lectures and it's the weekend. And at the time where you should be reviewing for recall, you're actually going through lectures for the first time. That is not where you want to be. Now, it is, it's really hard to to have that realization when you, you're to, to get accepted into medical school, you've done hard work. The hard part I'm, 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 I'm learning and trying to get people to understand the hard part is not getting into medical school. The hard part is finishing medical school. Um, you, you're so excited, you get accepted and then you're like, oh, we're learning now. Oh, okay. You're, you're teaching. I didn't know what this bone is called. All right, got it, sure. So my school starts with anatomy and I had never heard any of those terms before. I didn't take anatomy in undergrad. And I mean, I got, I, I, I literally felt like I was getting punched in the face every day because it was just that humbling to try and stay on top of all this information every day for two years. So just, I tell all the incoming first years, just be ready know that you're not going to be a straight A student. The, the tests are designed to stratify you. So just keep your head down, do the best you can. Um, and know that med school is going to humble you at some point. It, it is designed to do that. You are going to be humbled at some point. But I'm also a scientist. As I said, I'm in an MD PhD program. So I never intended to start out as an MD PhD um, student. I, that was not my plan at all. But as I continued to do research, I just found this whole other part of my brain that was dying to be used. Um, so I would say just be open. A lot of people come into medical school and they're like, I know exactly what kind of doctor I want to be. And they typically aren't going to end up being that kind of doctor because they find something in medical school that they like a whole lot more so just be okay with not knowing a hundred percent of what's going to happen and be willing to accept things as they come but don't let it be like to the point where i'm just you're just flying by to see your pants and you're just gonna let think let it happen as it as it goes but I did not intend to, to do, want to do research. I didn't even understand. I never, I didn't even meet a PhD person with a PhD until I was in college, but I'm halfway through uh, my PhD. I hope to graduate in 2023 next, next summer. Um, and like it was said in my intro, I study burns and the um, immune response to burns. And then subsequent bacterial infection, I could talk about it for a while since I just had a committee meeting on Wednesday. So I know my material real well, but it's kind of boring. So just 
be open to your long-term goal looking a little different because you don't know what's going to inspire you, motivate you, or spark something in your brain that you didn't know that you wanted to do. So this is us now. This is my daughter, Victoria. She is 12. This is Blair. She is 10. She'll be 11 next month. And this is my regret, Orion. He's eight. And it's me and my husband. Like I said, we we'll have been married 14 years next week. Um, this is a hard road. I have, I mean, just trying to maintain my kids' social calendars. I'm a soccer mom now. How did that happen? I don't know. Um, and I'm halfway through the PhD. I've had obstacle on top of obstacle with that. I can go into that. Um, I still have two more years of medical school to go. Um, trying to be a good wife, be a good mom, and still be a good friend. And I'm still, I have relations with, other, I'm a niece, I'm a, you know, just trying to maintain my relationship with my family. Um, it can be a lot but it's not impossible. I find that out every single day that what, what I'm doing and what others do is not impossible. I think it's just a matter of finding the people that you can model yourself after that are successful in what they're doing and doing what you wanna do and just try to learn from them as much as possible and implement what they are doing into your own life. So. I am not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. I really have more times that I don't like what I'm doing than I do, but I know that I'm on the right path, regardless of what obstacles get in my way. So I just, you have to stay focused on the long-term goal because every day is going to be hard, but know that at the end, you'll reach the goal that you set for yourself. And with that, I keep a pretty uh, detailed account if you want to know what happens moving forward on my Instagram. There is my handle. And I'm happy to take questions. I did it. I talked for 55 minutes. Proud of me. Okay. So the first question we have is, how do you navigate study time and parenting time? I keep a calendar of everything. So that's something I learned in undergrad. First, when I start a new semester, when, I, when you get the syllabus, I try to get it early if I can. But as soon as you get that syllabus, put everything on the calendar, all the exams, all the assignments, anything that you know is going to take up more time than normal, put it on a calendar. Find a calendar system that you like. I use my phone because I always have it with me and put it on the calendar. Then I schedule everything like all my kids all my kids soccer games as soon as the schedule comes out it goes on the calendar and whatever goes on the calendar you have to do it you have to do it so you can't just say oh i i wrote it down and then don't you don't stick to it if you put on the calendar you study study don't replace it with netflix or something like that like be dedicated to what you're trying to do and then also like I said I treated school like a job so I would have a space that was dedicated to me being a student so that when I came home I was mom and wife and then I told myself very early because mom guilt is a whole thing that I, I spend a quality of time with my children and not a quantity of time so that they feel as though I'm spending time with them and we're doing things that they are act actively engaged in and it's dedicated specifically to them so we have like family game night and family movie nights we take we have their birthday parties are out of control every year um, I do like themed Halloween um, for as long as they'll let me do it they're getting older now and they won't they probably won't play along but 
every year I do a themed Halloween photo shoot, like just things to make them feel seen and heard and appreciated as children. So it's a delicate balance because sometimes I feel like I'm leaning too far in one direction or the other, but you can't maintain that balance at all if you don't have a plan for it, if you don't have a plan for your time, for sure. So get a calendar. The next question is, what are your inspirations and motivation? Uh, student loans are a good motivator. I have to pay them back someday. It helps to have a job. Um, I, I, I say motivation is, a, is an emotion. It's something that you feel and it's temporary. It's not something that you're going to have all the time. I am not. I, every day I get up and I'm like, I got to do this again today. I don't want to do this. I'm not often motivated. What I am though, is dedicated to my long-term plan. Dedication is a personality trait. That is something that you can, a skill that you can build. Motivation is not going to be there for you. I'm just not, but excuse me. dedication is stick to the plan. The next question is, what's one piece of advice or resource that you use now that you wish you had known about when you were applying? When I was applying, I wish I knew Dr. Gray when I was applying. So um, Dr. Gray runs medical school HQ. And that man has like every pre-med resource known to man. Like he has a secondary repository of schools and like all the questions they ask and everything. I definitely wish I had that. I could have pre-typed all my answers. I think he talks about that. Then instead of, because when you apply to medical school, you send out your application at once to multiple schools and they will send you back a secondary application. And that has more detailed essay type questions. And they all just start coming all at once. And it's overwhelming. He has a list of all the questions that each school will ask you and you can like pre-write your answers so that as the secondaries come in, you can quickly fill it out and send it back. So, I mean, he has books about personal statements and everything. He's, I, I point students to him when people ask me questions, like I might not know the answer, but I know he definitely does. So. Uh, the next one is what type of tools do you recommend for learning how to study or how do you recommend studying? So how I study literally depends on the lecture. I know that's not, it's not good, but it depends on how the information is given to me. And it's studying is a skill at, at trying to, I'm trying to teach my kids this now while they're in elementary and middle school, how to study it's something that you have to develop. It's not just sitting and reading and highlighting in a textbook. It's definitely a skill that you have to learn. So I would take first, um, they have learning style quizzes that you can take to learn. Like I mentioned while I was talking, um, to know your learning style. And I know I'm a visual learner because I think I took one of those quizzes. And then I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. So I, they definitely have quizzes that you can take where you I can- put the link in the chat. For learning styles? Yes. Cool. So definitely that. Um, and that way, that'll tell you how to take your lecture slides and then turn it into study material. Um, cause like I said, I have to out the stuff can be presented to me in all kinds of crazy ways. I've done mind maps that helps me to organize a lecture, um, and put it in a visual, like something that I can see. And I love flow charts. Um, Anki, if you don't know what that is, I didn't learn about it until halfway through my first year of medical school. It's a flashcard program you need it like it's just constant repetition spaced repetition so that you actually are able to recall the information so once you get the information in a way that you can memorize it you make the flashcards and then you just go through them 
it, it's it's digital digital flashcards so anki know your learning style take the lecture put it in a way that you can understand it and can memorize it and then make flashcards to to memorize it or do what i did write everything over i like to write so write everything down over and over again for that repetition Another question was, can you speak on the importance of the individual story and why pre-meds need to learn, lean into their unique stories? So if nothing else, part of the application process is a personal statement. You need to be able to explain why you want to be a physician and, and not just why you want to be a physician, but why you want to be a physician and not another healthcare professional. What happened in your life that inspired you to do that? And I think a lot of students don't really value the personal statement, but that's your opportunity to speak directly to the admissions committee to explain who you are, how you ended up applying to their school, and why you think you want to be a physician and would make a good physician. So that in itself is the ability to to be able to tell your story is something that's measurable you can measure the response of being able to tell your story well is using it in your med school application but the other part of it is that and the reason why i do it is because you are able to explain where you came from to end up where you are and that other people are able to identify with your story and believe that they can do it too so that's why i have my instagram because i was going through medical school and i'm looking around i'm like there's 12 black women there's two moms i was the only mom of three there were three veterans and i was the only one that was all of those things so i know i can't be the only person in in the whole world that's like that but I know I felt alone in that moment. So to be able to share my story with others so that they can identify with it and then draw some motivation from that, draw some knowledge from that, draw inspiration from that is ultimately why I share my story. The next question is how was the difference in the social climate from grad school to med school and were people more open to connecting or more closed off? So I will say that my med school class was great. We had a Facebook page. We shared resources with each other. We helped each other, supported each other. I really had a great, they're second year residents now, but I did have a great med school class. The difference between med school and grad school is that med school is very much, I'm going to take you by the hand and we're dragging you through this education. Med school keeps moving no matter what. You know where you're going to be. You have your lectures for the whole semester up front. You know exactly what your schedule is. There's not a whole lot of thought on how to be a med student. You show up, you receive the information, you study the information, you take the test, you move on to the next block. Grad school is completely different. It's so individualized. My, my grad school experience is different from the another person in my program and different from somebody in a completely different program. So you can have friends that are just starting, get ready to defend, and anywhere in between, you can have friends that are still in class, you can have friends that are in the lab full time like I am. Um, it's a very individual experience. And then you're working by yourself because you have to be the one to produce the, the data. You have to be the one to do the experiments. You have, you're doing the entire project alone. So it's a very individual experience. It's not that people aren't willing to be friendly. It's just that you don't have time to be friendly because no one is pushing you to do the work you have to do the work and if you don't that's on you there's it's it's a it's a very different experience from medical school where if you don't show up somebody's emailing you somebody's calling you trying to figure out where you are whereas i could not come to work and my pi would be like i hope you're okay come back when you're ready it's, it's very self self-driven self-motivated you have to be on top of 
um, your accountability as a graduate student, for sure. Um, the next one is, what is your response to people when they ask if you're becoming a doctor just for the money? <laughs> yeah, I would say go into real estate then because uh, that's not. <laughs> there are so many ways to make more money faster with less debt than being a physician. That is an absolute fact. It... <laughs> No one goes into medicine for money. There, there are way easier ways to make money and make more money than going to medical school. And that's laughable that someone would go into medicine to make money. That, that's, a, that's silly <laughs> for somebody to think that. <laughs> Yeah, if anybody uh, tells you that, uh, at my work, we figured how much residents make an hour. Mes and it came at a dollar and 20. Residents I made more nothing. than residents. And we have an MD, PhD resident. Residents. They are indentured servants. <laughs> That's what they are. The hospital makes money off of them and they don't pay them. No, don't go into medicine for money. You go into medicine because you want to do medicine. <laughs> the, next one is, the, <laughs> the next one is, how does the application for the PhD MD differ from the MD program on the AAMC? So AAMC still runs everything. And when you want to apply MD, PhD, there's several options in the application. If you want to do dual degree programs, you can do like an MD, JD. Some schools offer that. I think my school offers that. You can do um, MD, MPH, whatever, MD, MBA. And then you just select that dual degree program that you want to do. And then the application will alter itself to reflect that. So for MD PhD, you have to do the entire MD application because you have to be accepted to the medical school in order to be in an MD PhD program at that school. There's no point in them saying you can be in our program if you don't get into the medical school. So you have to do the entire MD application. Then you have to do um, two additional essays and you need an additional letter of recommendation. So one is why I want to be a scientist, just like you have to write why I want to be a physician, but you get way more space. And then the other is all of my research experiment. Here's what I've done in the scientific community. And it's just, you have, it's basically like writing um, it, an example of your scientific writing, because you have to explain experiments and hypotheses and how do you collect it and analyze your data. It's, um, it's very much science speak. And then the letter of recommendation has to be just a research letter of recommendation. Can I, um, can you talk about like the MD PhD funding support? Um, <laughs> I'm laughing because I lost my <laughs> funding. <laughs> okay. So um, there's two different types of MD PhD programs. There's just MD PhD programs where your school is trying to offer two degrees where they've worked with, say they have a graduate school on the campus and the med school just lets you take a break and you go do the PhD. And then there's MSTPs, medical scientist training programs, which are funded by the NIH to be a dual degree physician scientist training program. And that the difference between them is funding. So the NIH, you have to apply if you want to make an MD, PhD, or MSTP at your school, you apply to the NIH and say, this is how we're going to train them. It's a formalized training plan to produce phys physician scientists, which is what my school has. If not, what the school is doing is using funding, say that a PI has from the NIH or grant that they have to support you individually and you just work in their lab on your thesis project and they'll support you that way. So the benefit to that is I receive a stipend because um, I have regrets and they like to eat food, as I mentioned. Um, and that stipend is guaranteed because it's through the NIH. 
Um, I, so the, what my school does is that they waive our tuition in the MD program. And then we have, because we're graduate students, we're tech, we're employees while we're in the PhD program. So our tuition is waived as an, as an employee while we're in the PhD program. They pay our health insurance and um, our fees for registration. And no matter what, if I'm in a lab or not in a lab, I receive my stipend. I know this because I was there. <laughs> my PhD lab that I was in, my PI did not have funding to continue to do research. I was two years into my PhD and I had to start over. While I was searching for a new lab, I still received my stipend. Like, there is guaranteed. Whereas in an MD PhD program, that funding is tenuous. You don't know year to year if your PhD will continue to be funded and then if your school will support you while you're you're not in a PhD um, in the PhD portion. Some schools um, don't give a stipend. They don't waive tuition. So it, that the MD PhD program versus the MSTP is a big difference. And they also are going to have a more formalized plan as an MSTP because they had to prove to the NIH that they would be able to make physician scientists. So if when you're looking, I'm not saying don't apply to MD PhD programs, but you want to look for MSTPs because they have a proven track record for producing MD PhDs that go on to be successful phys physician scientists. My That's my box. Uh, the other question is, um, was your age ever a hindrance for applying to MD, PhD? No. If anything, I think that me being older has made me, and having more experience um, makes me a better physician because I've worked a job. I've been a member of a team. I've been a leader. I've been a follower. I know how hierarchies work. Like I have world experience. A lot of my classmates went high school, undergrad, med school. So they don't really understand the ideas of having to be in a hospital at a specific time or um, having to work as a member of a team. They, they're like, I'm just here to be the student. And they don't really understand how to function in that way. And then they also have difficulty um, interacting with patients because they don't have a life experience um, their ability to, to engage and identify with patients is a little more difficult. Um, uh, whereas when I was in first and second year of med school, my, I, I had no problems talking to patients and, um, understanding like what I was supposed to get out of those experiences. Um, not to say that they, I mean, they all go on to be physicians amazing physicians because that's what med school does. It's supposed to teach you how to do those things. But I don't think that, that I was 31 when I started med school. I don't think that that was an issue. I mean, I got accepted, so. Or just like be showing up and doing a job, you know, yes, right. sir, no, sir. Right. Exactly. They don't, they don't have work experience. So <laughs> they, they come, they go to class and, maybe if it's recorded they don't go so they don't really understand like it's a hospital it's it's a business, business yeah <laughs> so, it's a business to make a lot of money <laughs> right and you not being there or you not doing what you're supposed to do is messing up people conducting business <laughs> yes you're here to learn but you're learning in a in a, a organization that's functional so I get that. The next question is, how have you managed to keep a stable marriage and family life having everything else on top of it? Babe. <laughs> oh, my husband is a whole saint. <laughs> like, he... Like I said, you can't do this without supportive people around you because it's demanding. It's demanding of your time and energy. And 
sometimes you need to be supported. I, I know I do a lot for my family. I have a very active role in my family, but my husband is there to take care of me and he does a great job. So what we try to do um, is we try to go out on dates. Uh, our kids are older now, so it's a lot easier to do. Uh, we, when we were in undergrad, we would study together because we were both just, we had the same like exam schedules and things like that. So we would study together. Just trying to do things that um, let your partner know that you're thinking about them and that they're on your mind, especially when you're not around and you're incredibly busy. Um, again, I'm crazy about like birthdays and holidays. So that's always over the top. And that goes for my husband as well. Um, it's, it's, it takes cons a concerted effort, but th at the end of the day, what I always say is that degrees gone, kids gone, job gone. The person that still needs to be with me is my husband. So I'm a wife first period. So if I need to spend time with my husband, then that's what's going to happen because we are going to be together forever. And I need him to want to be with me forever. So <laughs> I need to put the work in to make sure he wants to be with me forever. The next one is what classes do you wish you had taken or studied harder in, in undergrad before medical school? So there's nothing I wish I did hard, study harder in because I, I actually won outstanding senior when I graduated from undergrad. So I think I did all right as far as my performance in my classes. But I do wish I <laughs> took, oh God, I hate, I hate I'm going to say this, biostatistics because you can do all your research, but it, at the end of the day, people are looking for significance. They want those little stars next to your data and knowing what tests to run and see is, and then also I wish I had taken anatomy because just hearing that medicine is a language and hearing all those words for the first time and having to be accountable for them immediately was so hard. Um, yeah, anatomy and if on the PhD side, biostats. I can't believe I said biostats, but it's true. And the R final is question. a pain. R, <laughs> yes. Listen, listen, me and R are just not happy. We're not friends. It is so, but I get, I get figures out of it. So YouTube is my friend. So you don't deal with Python then? No, I use R and uh, Prism. Yeah, I don't like Prism. R is okay, but I, Python's my so friend. user friendly. But you gotta have the data in the right format before you put it in Prism. Yeah, and then it'll, it's it's good. But you have to know what you want the figure to look like before you put the data in Prism. But yeah, R I use R too. But yeah, I mean, that I, was I, a learning curve. <laughs> I've had cur I've had curse sessions in front of Prisms because I, I was doing to throw a project and stuff. <laughs> Listen, pro I'll process samples all day. I will generate the data, but processing the data. Yeah, no, I <laughs> prism. I used to curse at the thing, and but I learned Python, and I found Python. You know, you can manipulate things a lot better in there. But yeah, prism is. Uh, I've actually broken a keyboard. I think over it. Oh no! I just don't like not. This is so off topic. I just don't like not being able to see the see what's happening in R like I, you're typing in codes and you don't actually see what's happening I don't like that that's why I like prism but yeah I, I understand people don't like it I, I I use it I think the final question unless someone puts something in after I ask you this one but I will let you know is in what ways do you foresee your research education informing your practice as a physician? Okay, so I didn't go into a lot of detail about like future goals, but I wanna be a plastic surgeon 
with a focus on critical care. So Maryland is perfect because it has shock trauma at University of Maryland, and then it has the burn center at Hopkins. So I'd like to be a reconstructive plastic surgeon, not a uh, aesthetic plastic surgeon, I guess, um, because I am a veteran. I understand that what I do and study will eventually hopefully be able to impact the veteran community. And I, my research is looking into what happens after the trauma. Why are these patients more susceptible to infection? So eventually what I would like to be able to do is have protocols in place for these patients that experience trauma to prevent them from succumbing to sepsis, because that's a huge, um, it's a huge morbidity um, issue post-trauma is that the patients then don't die from the trauma, but they die from the infection. So that's where I see it long-term. I have a question. Um, sure. How have you handled racism and sexism through your education? The army is trial by fire. Like, I literally experienced so much <laughs> that now it's just like, that's, that's baby stuff. Um, it's a, it takes a lot to be a respected leader as a Black woman in the army. It is very much a white male dominated space and to be seen and heard and then respected, um, you have to have the thickest skin because any little thing is going to be blamed on, well, you, you only got that because you're black. You only got that because you're a woman. You know, you only got promoted because it, it, it doesn't matter how excellent your evaluations are. It doesn't matter how fast you can run, how well you can shoot. It, it all will come down to, well, they, you, you met a quota. I've literally had that said to me multiple times. Um, but it comes out in my job performance. So I I keep that same principle in everything else that as long I, my motto is above reproach as long as what i'm doing is by the book and i did it correctly i know that i'm right and that's how you have to approach anyone that says it wants to say anything to try and tear you down as far as race or sex the bottom line is i did what i had to do and i did it correctly and i did it well and that's it. You can try to say whatever it is, but when you go and look at my track record, it won't be supported. Any other questions? It says sepsis is a problem with burn victims. Yeah, that's what I study. I literally use a burn model to study um, post-burn infection. That is my thesis project. I don't want to talk about it though, because <laughs> I just talked to my committee about it for an hour and a half on Wednesday. Can but, you tell? Uh, can you tell them what that is? Like, what? Oh, what's... yeah. So when you get your PhD, you have to put together a committee of people, which are they have to be a certain level in the tenure track to serve on a committee. And these people are going to help guide you through the PhD process. Make sure that your questions that you're asking are sound and probable, that you're not going to waste time going down rabbit holes. Um, and make sure you stick to a prescribed timeline, which is really important for MD PhD students because you have to go back to medical school and finish the last two years of medical school. So your committee are a group of people that are basically like a big mentorship pod that are going to help you throughout your thesis project. But then they're ultimately the people that will grant you your PhD. So when you finish your project, you have to defend what you did. So that involves an oral presentation open to the public and then a private defense where they just ask you questions like, why'd you do it like this? Why, what, what about this? a data point right here and and at the end of it hopefully you get a phd 
So my committee um, is comprised of several faculty members that I talked to them about the, I, it was my first meeting within my new lab. And I'd let them know, like, this is the question that I have. This is how I plan to answer it. This is where I am in the process of answering these questions. Do you think this is a good idea? So that's what committee meetings are for. It went well, thankfully. <laughs> Thank you. Does anybody have any other questions? Because um, I'm she sure she, she has some rug racks to. They are being very quiet. We talked to them before we started. <laughs> So I'm sure I'm sure they want your attention. Um, Always, I, they, if one of them actually came in while I was talking. So. Alrighty, well, all right, it was a pleasure. Thank you all for listening. Hopefully, it wasn't.